We're back with black holes, cosmology, science, and futurism. Oh, and speaking of black holes, Penny, you hungry? You want some kibbles? I forgot you're in here. Let's go eat some kibbles. Keep in mind now this is the fate in chronology, the genealogy if you will, of the entire universe. But of course we're beings in a very local point, some tiny planet on some average star in a remote, uninteresting corner of a galaxy among hundreds of billions, billions and billions, of other galaxies in the universe. And we live inside it, so naturally it's prone to fallacy. But this is what we know about the universe thus far. It's our current theory for the naturally aging and expanding universe. Because the theory could be wrong or incomplete. And second, because we don't live in a universe that's likely to continue along any natural path because, well, because of us, we live in it. Intelligent critters and, and, and often do, actually, change their environment, after all, and generally tend to, uh, so we can easily extrapolate this concept to the scale of star systems, galaxies, and over millions and billions. Maybe even the universe itself. Who knows? These are geologic timescales, ones that we're not used to 
really thinking about on our daily <laughs> experience. So let's consider the Big Bang. It's worth keeping in mind that the universe began expanding then and continues to do so. We know that Hubble found that out by tracking stellar constant rotating pulsars called Cepheid variable stars. And from that, with a lot of imagination and creativity, he discovered that space is actually expanding, causing the light coming from Andromeda to actually red shift, to actually get more and more red as its wavelengths are stretched during its two million light year travel into our eyeballs and uh, apparatus, apparati, when we're observing it. So in this expanding universe from the Big Bang almost certainly has parts whose light will never detect. We will never see it. Sick. The actual space emerging between us and it is growing at such a rapid rate, accelerated rate, that the light literally can't traverse it fast enough. I don't do that often enough, maybe I should. So this expansion will only increase, and will only continue to grow, and eventually only the galaxies in our local group of galaxies, us, Andromeda, Triangulum, all the other Magellanic those unbounded galaxies get further and further and further and further and further and further away. And at that accelerating rate, the light from them eventually will redshift and get weaker and weaker until they eventually dissipate and disappear over the cosmic horizon. If we think, to give you an idea of how this works, of blue light as radiated from a neutron star, and this, this is really, <laughs> I'm really excited about this part. Technology, man, so cool. For instance, blue light radiated from a neutron star as a sinusoidal wave. I don't know if I can do that. Whose repeating peak passes a given point in space exactly, get this, 638 trillion with a T, trillion times every second. It's easier to visualize how it might redshift. See, as the thing that physicists call dark energy causes space itself to expand. Expand like dough in an oven. The light beam is stretched along with it because it isn't something like a medium that it's moving through so much as the structure of space-time itself, which I gotta admit, I don't even know what that means. But it's it's not so much inside it as a part of it. So light's moving through it as space is stretching. And because a light's light wave's energy and frequency are proportional, 
So as you increase the frequency from this to this, the energy also increases. They're proportional. When the wave stretches, it loses energy proportionally. When the beam is emitted from a star, it's only using as much energy as it initially left the star with. So it has no means of making up for the lost distance. Time. Distance, time, or energy while traversing that new space. So by the time it's traveled across billions and billions of years to reach in contact our retina, your retina when you look up at the night sky, the number of times per second at the peak of the wave passes our hypothetically rigid point in space is slowed now from 638 to 428 trillion times per second, which is the wavelength at which red light exists. sources of light out there that are red shifting. The Big Bang happened about 14 billion years ago. And just 400,000 years later, an event called the Last Scattering took place. And it's, and it's not a long time, it's an eye blink compared to the age of the actual universe. But nonetheless, it's still a significant amount. Still a hundred times longer than the recorded history of and duration of human existence. The last scattering was an important event Because up until then, the universe was a much, much smaller and denser, hotter place. And small and dense necessarily means hot. Very hot. Up until then, the universe would have glowed like a star. It wouldn't be transparent like it is today. Every single direction you look, it would be a big, white haze. A big haze. It would be very opaque, cloudy, hard to see through. But the light emitted didn't go far, because it was too hot for atoms to form yet. And in it, the universe. So think of it as just a big boiling pot of water. And then the universe starts cooling down and it's like going outside in negative 50 degrees and throwing that pot of water in the air and watching it evaporate and dissipate into smoke or steam. But nonetheless it gets a lot cooler, a lot less dense, and a lot more transparent. As it did cool down, suddenly atoms weren't scattered and bumping into each other, and they could form atomic nuclei. Protons could connect, and then neutrons would attach to them and form the most fundamental elements. Hydrogen.
in the first few handful of elements were formed, mostly hydrogen and helium though. Photons now could suddenly travel long distances without being likely to run into, bump into anything, and that only kept increasing. Most photons will never actually run into anything now, it's interestingly enough. As a result, there's always photons left over from then, that time, still flying around and zipping through space on an uninterrupted journey, never again to interact with any matter whatsoever. Now, when these photons started off, the spectrum was pretty similar to what stars emit, visible light, but over time as they traveled, with new bits of space emerging as they travel through it, and redshifting them, they've lost power, they've lost power over time. They went through infrared and finally entered the microwave range just recently. This is longer wavelengths. And this leftover radiation that's in the background of everything throughout the cosmos is called the cosmic microwave background radiation, or the CMP. And this was actually discovered by some radio astronomers called Penzias and Wilson. Penzias and Wilson. Wilson. When they were looking into the cosmos in the radio spectrum and they were getting some noise because microwaves and radio waves are very similar right next to each other on the electromagnetic Anyways, they discovered this. As more time passes, this microwave background radiation will grow weaker and weaker, and the universe will keep expanding and cooling. Eventually, it will get so weak and cold that those bigger, naturally occurring black holes will finally start giving off more Hawking radiation than they actually absorb in background radiation. So, it doesn't seem like much. But photons are units of energy. And even the weak, barely detectable microwave background radiation Imagine the universe expands to such a degree that there's no more matter. The black holes already absorbed it, like Penny Eden or Gibbles. And all it has left is this background radiation. Eventually that radiation will get weaker and weaker and weaker and shift into the radio wave length. And then eventually it'll dissipate in its entirety. And we're talking trillions and trillions of years here. So, again, it's unimaginably long timescales. Literally unimaginably. So, so far in the future. It's hard to wrap your head around it, really. was that black holes will take a long, long time to eventually 
start to actually age or lose, lose mass. But they will, from Stephen Hawking, his famous theory that I can't explain it honestly, but I know that the essence of it is that black holes lose through quantum fluctuations, I believe. Through some weird quantum entanglement, they blip, and they're able to randomly blip over and out from inside the black hole, the over the event horizon over which the gravitation is so strong that not even light could travel fast enough up the gravitational well to get out. And if you give it enough time, enough of these quantum mysterious fluctuations will happen where the black hole will lose blips. of light, photons, and begin to age. So right now, all naturally occurring black holes are actually growing in mass, of course. There's still lots of stars, lots of dust, lots of matter drifting around in the cosmos. And in these black holes, while there's still that CMB, the radiation background. They'll still continue to grow even in the absence of matter and mass. When things are that cold though at the trillion year mark is a long, long way off. We're talking tens of trillions of years. And before we get there, We have our sun slowly getting hotter until it eventually renders Earth completely and entirely uninhabitable. It's going to go red giant, swallowing the Earth, leaving behind an Earth-sized dense corpse called a white dwarf, which generates no new energy um, from fusion, but still gives off quite a bit of light compared to what our planet actually uses, and it ought to be still warm enough to light many, many Earths for even longer than the current remaining lifetime before going red giant. And that's our first example at, uh, of civilizations at the end of time. Because normally we figure it's the end of the road when our star goes red giant, but at least here on Earth. it won't be because there are intelligent animals on it like you and I or me I don't know how intelligent but hopefully our ancestors by the billion year mark will be able to save it we may come back and explore this idea in detail later but but for now, I want to use it as an example of how you can't necessarily extrapolate the future of, of our universe naturally as we think of it. And I think that's a fallacy to, uh, to forget that, in fact, we are a part of the universe and its natural state. And 
so over the period of billions of years you can't expect lifeless, dead, spiritless matter to evolve in a Newtonian mecha mechanistic billiard ball style. We're going to create and invent other civilizations, other species, and yes, aliens. I galaxies evolve will necessarily change stars will be harnessed maybe corralled who knows but it won't evolve and play out as though we don't exist I'm pretty certain of that So we need to consider our impact on the timeline when we're talking about the fate and chronology of the universe. Up till now, as far as we know, nothing cog conscious and cognitive, cognizant has affected the course of um, physical evolution. But from here on out, we know it's a possibility. So a billion years from now, without intelligence on Earth, it might be rendered, rendered uninhabitable by the sun growing hotter, but that probably won't be how it goes down. We might sterilize our planet and ourselves long, long, long before that. We might. We might. Whether it's on purpose or even on accident, which I think is a valid concern. As the pace of technology increases, it gets We might even disassemble Earth for building material used in space-based megastructures. There is, of course, the basic, basic idea that a planet, in terms of living area, this is really cool too, there is, of course, a uh, this basic idea that the planet, in terms of actual living area on the surface versus the mass that it contains, is basically as efficient as a mountain with a few caves on it. In other words, you could disassemble that entire mountain and create a slew of buildings stone or iron metal buildings in which many 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 more people could live than in just a few caves drilled into the side of it so 
so logically you can get a lot more space by disassembling an entire planet to build mecha structures in space. Pretty cool idea. I like that. use um, the rock and metal to build skyscrapers. Scraping the sky above from the ground or in orbit. Scraping the atmosphere. Scraping the atmosphere from above. So, so we might do that and have no planet here in a billion years. And we might have an entirely reconstructed series of structures that exist in the ever-dynamic Goldilocks zone around our increasingly warming sun. Or we could shield the planet. Putting a large, thin shade between us and the sun, decreasing the entirety of the light that we we get, especially in the infrared light. That's pretty useless for plants to prevent unnecessary overheating. Or we could even just move the planet again, move it. exist very happily for years and years to come. But moving moving planets is pretty time consuming and it might not be the most innovative way of going about preserving the planet. But it could be done over maybe billions or at least millions of years, slowly pushing the planet into a larger and larger and larger orbit, yet maintaining its stability and dynamic interaction with the other bodies in the inner solar system. So in a billion years we can still protect Earth from the red giant phase of our sun, we can weather it out and come back in to live around the white dwarf remnant for billions and billions of years. Longer. But of course, even 30 billion years from now, when the white dwarf, white dwarf, is too decayed and, uh, you know, too weak to draw any useful amount of energy from. In other words, it'll be a black dwarf at that point because it won't be emitting any more light. The universe will still be young and thriving in many, many other areas. Our star, I think, is a third generation star which means in the course of 13, 14 billion years that we think the universe is. Our star is only the third generation since the Big Bang. So of course, there's still going to be many more 
generations of stars yet to come. Our galaxy will still be forming stars at the same rate as now 30 billion years from now, but only a bit faster, since we will have merged with Andromeda by then. Um, even some of our other local galaxies will actually have been merged, or at least be approaching us very, very closely by then. It won't be for about 800 billion years that, which is about 200 times the age of the Earth, or 60 times the age of the entire universe. 200 million times the duration of recorded history. So in 800 billion years, that star formation will start to die off, finally. And it will be an estimated 100 trillion years before it ceases entirely. There are stars that live longer than a trillion years and will still be around when the formation begins to ebb off, and they are more efficient at burning their hydrogen into helium too, so we could cluster or herd gas giants to fuel these efficient stars for trillions of years, and remember a trillion is a thousand billion years, so many thousands of billions of years, but again we're trying to probe and speculate at the uppermost extreme of space and time, based on what we know right now at least. Or along that same line of thought, is that we could essentially create compact Dyson spheres of high, ultra high efficiency around these stars to extend them even longer. So we could absorb the radiation so much that no excess light will go unused or will exist. Excess. Excess means, of course. But we, yeah, we could harness to the ultimate efficient capacity the stars that are already in themselves extremely, extremely efficient. Nevertheless, nonetheless, we get stars for around 100 trillion years. So, nonetheless, we have 100 trillion years of luminary sources of energy from the most efficient stars, and, of course, by then, I'm sure we'll have created some extremely efficient way of harnessing nearly 100%, maybe even 200%, no, I'm just kidding, of energy. And actually, even though the universe will be composed of nothing but brown dwarfs, white dwarfs, black dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes, they will occasionally run into each other. And a white dwarf merging with a brown dwarf could actually form a new star as the hydrogen is added to that stellar remnant. Though if it is added too fast, you're going to get a supernova. A whole lot of hydrogen hitting a white dwarf or a neutron star or two of them slamming into each other is actually quite common. I didn't realize this, since many stars are actually binaries. Um, 
Yeah, it's really interesting that many stars are actually exist in binary pairs. In the bigger of the pair, we'll usually go red giant and expand to include its neighbor and cause that star's orbit through friction, tidal forces, to decay. So their orbit will decay just like an accretion disk until they run right into each other. In this, we'll keep up again more star formation, but that universe at the 100 trillion year mark will be pretty dark, pretty cold, and just keep getting more so. Where was I? Let's see. I think I lost my place here. will have long, long ago either folded into our own or fled over the cosmic, cosmological event horizon, never to be seen again. We'll still see light coming from them forever, but it'll keep redshifting, redshifting, redshifting. will eventually dissipate over the horizon. So, 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 where are we left? Let's see, where are we? So where are we going with this? The universe, stars will expand, dwindle in the black dwarfs, they may merge, we might create Dyson spheres to harness energy for at least 100 trillion years. But of course that's inside our galaxy, and all the while, all the galaxies that haven't already merged with us, because they've been gravitationally bound from the beginning like Andromeda, which would be really cool, seeing that thing get looming ever, ever bigger until it encompasses the entire night sky. All those other galaxies, they will have already drifted from the expansion of space well over that event horizon. Of course, as those other galaxies do drift out of reach, out of sight, they will drift out of mind, out of communication with us. So despite any actual potential communication between entire galaxies, unintentional or intentional, we will have lost contact with them by this point. We won't be able to talk to them anymore. The signal lag will keep getting longer and longer and longer until it becomes infinite. And that'll happen a lot sooner, actually, than our stars burning out. The universe keeps expanding in size, but the observable universe
which also keeps expanding in size, is constantly hemorrhaging mass over the horizon. Most of the galaxies that aren't close enough will to, to be gravitationally bound, but close enough to be reached without faster than light travel, could conceivably be colonized over the billions and billions and trillions of years to come, or might host alien life forms that we exchange a long, very delayed, cordial talk with. And Isaac Arthur, actually, I'm so grateful for, um, really most of this content is from his videos of black hole farming. It's, you guys have to check out his channel. It's, he's a physicist who writes and speculates using physics, using science, about future civilizations, about future rhythm futurism. Um, he coined this phrase, the long goodbye. Uh, but yeah, go check out his YouTube channel if, you, uh, if you're if you interested in this stuff and haven't somehow heard of him already. Because all of the civilizations around will presumably be emitting their history and commentary, of course, on the life, on their life, constantly, and, and one by one, the furthest ones will disappear. And you, from them, and you know when it was coming, so you could send out one last message. It would probably be a sad goodbye, because it would seem as if you haven't, if by then you hadn't figured out faster than light travel, you might as well settle in. Might as well get comfortable for the end. But the most interesting idea here is that it doesn't have to be the end. And the speed of light actually becomes an increasingly smaller hindrance. I know I keep saying this, but it's fascinating, this part here in particular. It, the speed of light, as time rolls on, doesn't... has a less and less significant impact. Even though the universe keeps getting bigger. explore exactly what beings this close to the end of time could accomplish with the matter and energy left to them at this point in our next and final episode of our black hole civilization trilogy. give you a hint, it has to do with the extreme durations of time and our ability to slow perceived time if we exist as conscious entities inside a simulated universe. Time will lose relevance and perhaps even the matter outside the simulation to the exclusion, of course, of the apparatus within which we're existing. It'll lose significance as well, as long as those you care about, whatever that means by then, hundred trillion years from now, exist with you within the same time reference. 
God, this stuff is so, so fascinating for me. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, it's so interesting how the physics of star formation and black holes and the dynamic interactions of, of matter and space and what we can possibly do with all this knowledge. I mean, the structures that we could possibly build, Dyson spheres and just the sheer enormity of the scales of these things, to me, strikes my mind with awe. It makes my hair stand up almost. So, uh, I, I hope you guys are interested in part three. We're going to explore all about the perception of time and how we can get the most bang for our buck. In terms of fusing technology with life in a simulation. Yeah, it's just, this guy's brilliant the way he thinks things through. I love it. I really do.